presentation, so it's fantastic. Um, so apparently I'm Chris Avalon, uh, in case you didn't see from the slide here. Uh, I am going to fire up my slides right here. They are very high tech, but I feel they're very much in keeping with the theme of my presentation, which is how to develop old school RPGs using new school models, using Kickstarter development. And that is perhaps the longest title I have ever had for a presentation at any conference. And it's my goal to use words to break the title length and pamphlets and get people who do the layout totally pissed off at me. So hopefully that was very, very successful. So again, I'm Chris Avalon, in case I haven't said that enough. Uh, I am creative director for a company called Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, we are located in beautiful, sunny California, which I did not realize exactly how sunny it is until I got here to Montreal. And I'm like, wow, nothing wakes you up more in the morning than just stepping outside into the freezing cold. So I am very alert right now, and it's not just the caffeine. Uh, I am also, uh, being from California, I am also an ugly American. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I don't know the local mannerisms. Uh, I don't know how to behave very well. Uh, I actually have no idea what I, was think what I was thinking when I was drawing this hat right here. I was trying for a cowboy hat. It came off as a combination fedora, cowboy hat. I don't even know what it is. But ultimately, uh, if you try and speak to me in French, uh, you will be met with a bewildering, bewildering gaze from me because I know very little French whatsoever. Uh, I might be able to say like, je m'appelle Chris Avalon, uh, je ne parle pas français, and then when you, like, you shake your head just wearily at me, I'll go, je sais, je sais. Um, I spend most of my time at Obsidian, uh, do uh, writing for various of our role-playing game products. I have been doing this for a very, very long time. This slide right here is actually what I used to use to demonstrate the chronology of my career. And you can tell exactly how long I've been in game development because of the CRT monitor that I drew in that cartoon. I now have a much more streamlined monitor in the office, which I had to finally beg my boss for because he's very, very stingy about a number of things. But you know what? In a boss, that's important, especially if you want to stay solvent in today's game, game development arena. Uh, I also moonlight as a human stretch goal on Kickstarter. Uh, I don't mind saying that uh, I prostitute myself quite frequently. It's all in the name of writing, so I'm absolutely comfortable with that. And I wanted to thank you all very much uh, for allowing me to be here. Even if I can't actually get all of the French right, uh, I do really appreciate the invitation and the chance to speak about Kickstarter and role-playing games. Uh, I've worked on a number of titles over the years, uh, some of which actually got to see the light of day, others of which got horribly canceled and made me very, very sad to my core. But hey, that's game development, and if you guys uh, have not had a title canceled on you, you probably just have not been in game development long enough. I was lead designer on Planescape Torment, also Knights of the Republic II, Alpha Protocol, uh, I had the joy of working on both Fallout 2 and Fallout New Vegas, which was a big surprise to us. We didn't think we'd ever get the chance as a studio to go back and revisit the Fallout franchise, but Bethesda gave us that opportunity, which was awesome. I also headed up a lot of the DLC content for Fallout, except for Honest Hearts, which was led by our Project Eternity uh, project director, uh, Josh Sawyer. And currently our studio is working on South Park, the Stick of Truth, which is going to be your character's epic quest to become cool. And I hope you guys enjoy it very much. But back to old school RPGs. So also I've been involved with a number of Kickstarter projects, uh, Wasteland 2 for NXile Entertainment, Project Eternity at Obsidian, which is being done by <laughs> Uh, this individual right here is uh, Tim Kane from uh, the Fallout 1 fame. Uh, he's a very modest individual. He's doing a lot of our systems design and programming for Project Eternity. This is the amazing Josh Sawyer over here, who was our project director for Eternity, and they are both wonderful individuals. And I love finding gifts like this on the internet because it shows that people out there care enough to mock us, which is absolutely fine. I'm also working on Torment, Tides of Numenera with Exile Entertainment. Also, a pen and paper RPG called Accursed, where you get to play a variety of monsters seeking redemption in a very, very dark world, which appeals to my heart. 
And also, announced yesterday, uh, I also uh, begged the writer and the developers for FTL over a very drunken conversation. If there's any way that I could write for FTL for free, I would do it. About five or six beers in, they were like, look, you know, we'll talk to people, we'll see what can happen. And then about a few weeks later, they're like, yeah, if you want to write some events and encounters for FTL, you are absolutely welcome to. And I was like, woo! So uh, I am writing for the FTL Advanced Edition, which is going to be available free to you guys. So if you enjoyed the first FTL and want some more spacefaring, roguey goodness, FTL is your cup of tea. And all of these were brought to you by the power of Kickstarter, which makes me incredibly happy. And if you were any of the backers for any of these projects, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I can't tell you how much it's meant to In Exile, how much it's meant to Obsidian, and just to the gaming community at large to be able to see new ideas being brought out in the community backed by player support. So thank you very much. If you're one of the backers, we really, really appreciate it. And I realize that aside from the MIGS party last night, uh, I am very thankful that you guys are even here. There are certainly better things you possibly could be doing with your time. I know that I am tempted to run back to my room right now and play the Bioshock DLC, but I will hold off for a bit in order to be able to do this presentation. Um, I've tried to structure the presentation so there's plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, there is a reason for that. I usually find that questions that I get from the audience are often far more interesting than anything that I could bring to the table. Um, so, uh, and also another reason for that is when I was trying to get into game development, uh, I found that there were very, very few people that would ever give me any advice or feedback on my portfolio or just answer any of my questions in general. So now that I'm in game development and I have about 20 years of mistakes that I can share with you guys, please feel free to stop me in the hall, ask me at the end of this presentation. I would be happy to share any of those mistakes with you and hopefully prevent you from following in my tragic footsteps. Also, I don't want to keep you guys from lunch, so the presentation has been kept relatively short as well. So old school RPGs, uh, what do I mean by that? Um, so I mentioned a few of them, Wasteland 2, Torment. Uh, again, those are being done by, oh my god, what was that? Did somebody die? Okay. <laughs> First presentation death of the conference, yes! Uh, and also Project Eternity, like I mentioned before. What makes these old school RPGs? Um, there's a lot of differences amongst each of the products, which I'll get into, but all of them sort of have their own common roots about them, which I'll also uh, delve into in this presentation. So let me start with The Amazing Wasteland 2, which you guys may not be aware of from the title, but is a sequel to the first Wasteland. Uh, it is actually the spiritual ancestor of Fallout, which is a very rare thing for me to say, because I'm so used to saying the word spiritual successor to just about every Kickstarter project. In this case, Wasteland is actually the ancestor of Fallout. What happened was, Interplay did Fallout, you know, did, uh, did Wasteland way back in the 1980s. Uh, Electronic Arts owned, owned the rights for the franchise. So when Interplay wanted to do another Wasteland game, they actually found out they couldn't. So they're like, oh crap, we have to make a brand new franchise that's a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. It's probably not gonna have the same appeal as Wasteland. It's probably not gonna go over very well. So they made Fallout. And of course, that took off and that was pretty freaking great. Um, so Wasteland's come a long way from its early roots. And I will say that people that have backed the project who strangely enough are not familiar with Wasteland sometimes worry if Wasteland 2 is going to look like this. Don't worry, it won't. It's much more along the lines of Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 in terms of its presentation. It will not look like Fallout New Vegas, which while a very pretty and beautiful game, is not what we're shooting for with this project. We're shooting more, very much for an isometric role-playing game experience where you take a squad of rangers across the Arizona desert because apparently in the world of Wasteland, Arizona is the only place that really has any civilization. I have no idea why this is, but driving through Arizona, I am constantly confused by it. Uh, Wasteland was a pretty great role-playing game, uh, and when I say pretty great, I mean awesome. Uh, it had an amazing skill set like being able to repair toasters. I have never seen a role-playing game where there's a skill where you can repair toasters. You were also able to clone your party members. I have never seen a role-playing game where you can clone your own party members and add them to your party. That's fucking fantastic. 
Also, they had levels where like, you could do amazing things like transfer your consciousness into an android's brain and then use your intelligence stat to fight all the monsters that were present in the android's brain. That was also fantastic. It did a lot of groundbreaking stuff that I have not seen in a lot of role-playing games to date. It had a lot of really strong skill sets and systems about it. Uh, it. It did not shy away from numbers and character advancement and allowing a lot of depth in terms of how you develop your character. And it was a squad-based role-playing game where you took your squad of rangers, uh, you were able to divide your party and sort of uh, outflank opponents and use that to your advantage when fighting various hostile creatures in the environment. So ultimately, uh, that's sort of the wasteland uh, genre. But in terms of how we're approaching developing Wasteland 2, there's a lot of differences in our development cycle that have just been brought to us just because we're using Kickstarter. The first and most important thing, which is absolutely fantastic, is that we are actually able to share our development process. I'm actually able to talk about it to you today, which is something that we are rarely allowed to do while we're in the middle of development for any project. Um, not only that, we are allowed to share technology amongst various companies. So I brought up the, uh, the, the company in exile a few times in the presentation. They're located about 15 minutes away from Obsidian, you know, just down the road. We used to work with Brian Fargo back at a company called Interplay. And we have a really good rapport with him in terms of sharing technology, sharing assets, sharing aspects of our editor that we developed for both games. And having that sense of camaraderie between the two companies is also really rare, but it's something that Kickstarter allows for. It's a much more relaxed development cycle, and I have no idea why the projector keeps blacking out at that. I think the projector is drunk, and it needs to go home. So I mentioned sharing before. Uh, not only that, but as I mentioned, we're able to share a lot of development aspects with the community, which is fantastic. Um, we're able to discuss uh, why we arrived at certain design ideas, discuss various system mechanics, uh, share various interface designs. And the most interesting thing about that process is we discovered that most of our backers are insanely critiquey about our interface designs, fantastically enough. Uh, our art director used to joke that we've had an interface design position on our site for many, many months and not gotten any applicants. But as soon as we post a single image of an Eternity interface screen, suddenly we find there's a hundred interface developers out there, all with their own critiques and their ways of approaching the interface, which is welcome because it's good to get that feedback, but it's been kind of interesting to, uh, to see the amount of interest that people have in certain aspects of design. Also, uh, we're able to share things that we do wrong. Uh, we are able to discuss freely things like, hey, certain systems that didn't work out, Here's the reasons why, we, why, we, why this particular implementation didn't work out. Here's a reason why we're adjusting the various abilities to do various different things. That's not something that all uh, publishers would be interested in hearing from a developer or would want us to broadcast to the community for fear of exposing too much information. I feel that that freedom of dialogue is really, really important. I think it's cool, to see, cool for backers to see the steps that led to certain decisions and also give them the, the ability to weigh in on those decisions as well. We were also able to do something with Wasteland 2, which I've never been able to do before, and that's be able to share the vision of the game. We actually, uh, Matt Finley uh, and uh, Brian Fargo, who are sort of the heads of In Exile, we all sat down in a room and we broke down the pillars of what the game was going to be about. Like, what sort of ambience do we want it to have? What sort of experience do we want the player to have? And we transcribed that into a document, and terrifyingly enough, we put it up on the net before we even entered full production. And that is something that with a traditional publisher model, we would not be able to do. But being able to share that vision with the community, share, them, share with them what our vision was, what our perspective was in the wasteland world, and see if they actually had buy-in on the concept was really, really exciting to us. Kickstarter's also been a different experience because it's allowed backers to customize the delivery of the product. Obviously, Kickstarter has a series of reward tiers about it that says, hey, how much stuff do you want in terms of your packaging materials for your product? Do you want extra games? Uh, do you want uh, your very own bound manual? Do you want Tim Kaine's recipes on how to make 
nuclear mushroom treats? Do you want uh, various spiral bound manuals, like uh, actual physical cloth maps? These are things that players have wanted from various games as they're being delivered, and Kickstarter allows them that opportunity to, uh, to pay more money to allow those items to be developed. And these are things that developers actually do want to include in their titles, but when you're actually releasing a product that might have you know, a few million people purchasing it, or you know, God knows how many you know, people bought, have bought Call of Duty, doing that in a traditional publisher model is a lot more difficult in terms of logistics, but a smaller Kickstarter project allows that sort of individual treatment for each of the packaging delivery mechanisms that backers may want. <coughs> And that's the first time I've actually been involved in a process where you're allowed to customize the design of what the actual end product that gets delivered to, delivered to users is. One of the things that's also been a big game changer uh, with our development process is the actual Unity engine. Um, Unity is not only affordable, but it's very, very powerful. And it also comes with a complete package of what you need to develop the kind of games that we're targeting. And that becomes really important because, uh, our, first of all, our programmers love it. They're able to add a lot of functionality that's needed for sort of doing the systems, the, the, the inventory designs, and other elements that are needed for, for an isometric role-playing game. But we actually have our own in-house proprietary engine, and it's called Onyx. We, also, we discovered that during the Kickstarter process, we actually could not afford to use this engine, which was kind of a surprise to us. The reason for that is that even though we developed our own technology for how we, do, how we would do a role-playing game engine, all the middleware costs associated with the engine put it out of the price range for what we got for the Kickstarter. So when I say, when I say middleware, I mean things like you know, adding, a, adding the tie-in to the Havoc physics engine, adding in tie-ins to Bink, all of, those, all of those sort of extra programs that get fed into an engine, all of those have certain costs associated with it that when you're only dealing with a Kickstarter that may have raised like only 3.9 or $4 million, that quickly puts this engine out of the price range for using it for, a, for the kind of RPGs that we're doing, which makes Unity a perfect option for developers looking to do a more low-scale um, role-playing game. Um, fortunately, though, we were able to take certain elements out of the Onyx engine. For example, uh, our narrative designers, notably me, uh, are incredibly fussy about how to write dialogue and branching dialogue trees. So we actually developed that for the Onyx engine and were able to extract that and put that into Unity with relatively minimal effort. So being able to do elements like that in our development have been, uh, have been a real strength and really good to see. Digital distribution has also changed the, scale, changed the way that we approach the, uh, the development of the game as well. Not having to worry about a final boxed product or the distribution channels for that and being able to focus on Steam and GOG has been a huge relief, has been a huge, huge relief to us. Also, um, there has been a lot of elements involved with downscaling the team from creating environments like this, like in New Vegas, to creating more uh, isometric, uh, top-down camera view environments for these role-playing games. Seeing the team size uh, go from you know, anywhere from 60 to 70 people, and even that for a AAA title is relatively low. Seeing that go down to about a team of 20 people has been incredibly refreshing. We discovered this when doing the, uh, the New Vegas DLCs, that having a much smaller team focused on an end result was a lot more empowering for the various members because then they could take on multiple duties and wear different hats in terms of game development. So for example, uh, on Fallout New Vegas, uh, we had a number of developers that were just focused on doing nav mesh for the title because the world was so huge. And if you're not familiar with that wonderful process, what nav mesh means is they get to go through every surface you can walk on in New Vegas and put down a pathing triangle to make sure the player and the monsters can walk on it. That is a very mind-numbing task, but that's what they would be doing for 40 hours a day. But when you have a much smaller scoped project, you're actually able to see 
get, give, the, give, give individuals like that an opportunity to do things like, hey, in slide art, uh, do level design, and basically take on more responsibilities than they would in a larger project, just because the resources have been scaled down. So that's been pretty refreshing. Um, and as much as there have been differences in our process, there are a number of things that have still stayed the same about how we develop these role-playing games. Um, our strategies in terms of how we approach design is still much along the same lines that we do for sort of a triple A role-playing game. We still prioritize a lot of our design elements. It's always important that everyone on the team understand what the A priority issues are for things that absolutely must go into the game versus the C priority items that are like, hey, you know, the player may not miss items like this, but if we were able to add it, it would make the game more fun. We still track all of our assets and design elements for the game to make sure nothing gets lost. We try and focus on making sure that we develop our systems first in terms of, hey, how do the powers work? How do the character's abilities work? Before we start laying out a whole you know, shitload of levels, we try and make sure we understand how the player moves through the environment, how combat's going to work, how the, mo how the moment to moment movement of the character, making sure that, that feels good before creating the context of the world around it. Approaching the narrative it has been uh, similar to our other products. We've actually had more time to iterate on the storylines for the, uh, the Kickstarter role-playing games. There's actually been a, a welcome change of pace, in my opinion. Usually, we have to develop the story within the first, first one or two milestones of delivering sort of a more traditional publisher model RPG. But with both Torment and Project Eternity, we've had a lot of time to kick around the story, making sure the themes are strong, uh, making sure the character's uh, path of the game, all it's, it's hitting all the right beats, and all of that, being able to take our time with that until it feels solid and right to us has been really, really great. Uh, in terms of approaching uh, level design, uh, there's still a lot of things that we do uh, the same way. Uh, when we were first doing the level design for Wasteland 2, I actually uh, thought back to many of the Fallout 2 area design documents that we used to do way back when, uh, when uh, I was a much, much younger individual. Um, we still do things like flow charts in terms of uh, figuring out uh, what the player's movement path is through the level, how all the levels are connected in terms of like, okay, well, how do all these individual levels that are getting loaded up, how do they all fit together? Like, what, what, what do you expect the player's experience to be as they go through each segment of this particular level? And also, we set it up so that, hey, if we do need to drop a level at some point or downscale a particular area, what ones can be dropped out easily and still maintain the level design flow? And also, uh, and this is my, one of my favorite parts of the process because I rarely get to draw levels anymore and then lay them out into design documents. But we also try and make sure that the, the moment to moment experiences for each of the sub areas are being covered as well. So for example, a lot of the design elements that we have for uh, the areas in Wasteland 2, we try and make sure we mark out things like, hey, what are good ambush points? You know, where, what's, a good, what's a good area in the game for snipers to be able to take out opponents at a distance? Like are there areas where you can use your computer science skill? to hack turrets? Like, are there good places where you can use your lock picking skill to break into certain areas? How can the character feel special with the game mechanics in every individual area in Wasteland 2? And doing, laying out those areas is actually a lot of fun, and I certainly do enjoy doing that. We still do a lot of concepting for how we expect our levels to develop in terms of just doing from sketches to concept art to actually doing the gray boxing of the, le of the levels to make sure the game, the game flow feels good when you're actually running through the build. And then we lay all, lay all that stuff out in Unity, run through it a few times, test out the quests and the encounters to make sure they feel right until we arrive at the finished product, and we polish the shit out of that to make sure that it feels beautiful. And that's kind of the process that uh, we use with Project Eternity. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, what Project Eternity is, once upon a time, I used to work for a studio within Interplay called Black Isle Studios. We did a lot of what's called Infinity Engine games. And the Infinity Engine uh, was an engine developed by the fine folks at BioWare. And we turned out a number of products from uh, Baldur's Gate to Icewind Dale to Planescape Torment. Uh, Baldur's Gate was developed by BioWare. Icewind Dale and Torment were developed internally uh, by Interplay. And the, the whole focus of those games was to travel to exotic locations, uh, sometimes in cr 
crappy gnomish airships. Uh, and basically explore and dungeon, dungeon delve these locations and have a really great Dungeons and Dragons experience in the Forgotten Realms and or Planescape. They were very much hardcore role playing games. Uh, there was a lot of dungeon delving aspects from Icewind Dale that we wanted to include in Project Eternity. Uh, a lot of the companion depth and interactions that we had in Planescape Torment we wanted to make sure was also embodied in the title. And Baldur's Gate was sort of our target title for what we wanted Project Eternity to be. It felt like Baldur's Gate encapsulated all the elements that we were shooting for. And we felt that a number of players out there missed that Baldur's Gate experience and would want to see it again. And when we, when we launched our Kickstarter, boy, were we right. Uh, Project Eternity has a, lot of, has a lot in common in terms of these old Infinity Engine games also had a, a sort of grandiose world for you to explore, a lot of cool locations that you could plunder and steal all the treasure from while admiring their beauty, and a lot of tactical combat involving all the members of your party in terms of how to approach certain encounters, how to mini-max the various skills and abilities to achieve success. All of that was, was recognized as a number of the pillars that we were shooting for in this title. And what I have here is a few of the screenshots for some of the environments that we're developing for Eternity. Uh, we plan to have a game pay, gameplay trailer available in a few weeks for you guys to check out. But these, have, these environments are all 2D environments that we've actually set up with the Unity engine. And we've been capable of creating some absolutely beautiful outdoor environments. Uh, we're able to play around with a lot of animations in those areas. Uh, play around with the day-night cycles to create these really beautiful vistas and locations for the player to explore. We have a lot of the party-based combat that the Infinity Engine games are known for. And we're also developing a lot of the depth of the companions and the interactions that we plan to, uh, to develop for the title as well. So seeing that all come along and come together has been really, really great for the studio. Uh, in terms of our strategy, however, there have been some differences in how we approach some of these elements. One is we, when we were doing the Infinity Engine games back at Black Isle, we had to recognize that we were sharing someone else's universe, which meant that we can't mess, we can't mess it up too much. You, know, you have to sort of you know, put all the dishes back you know, after the meal is over and make sure that anyone else who might be using that world you haven't blown it up or dropped a nuclear warhead on it or you know, destroyed some planes so they no longer exist and they vanish from existence. We discovered that we were doing Project Eternity that because once again we were creating a franchise, we recognized that we also sort of have that limitation. We very much want Eternity to also be source books, to be a world that people can share. So recognizing that we're creating a franchise and there's a certain amount to how much we can modify and shape the world from that first game, we have to be really careful in how we approach it because we're actually creating a world that goes beyond the game itself. That said, um, we also recognize that even though we're not doing a Dungeons and Dragons game, there are certain homages that we want to do to make people feel like they're still in those Infinity Engine D&D games. So for example, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Mind Flayers in D&D. Uh, I do know that whenever our adventuring party goes up against them, uh, it gets really tiresome to have our brains sucked out and all our fighters being destroyed by them. But we actually try and have creatures that represent sort of a classic D&D style monsters in Eternity with some slight variations. The, uh, we actually have the Vithrak here, which has a lot of similarities to the Mind Flayer, including uh, you know, the big sweeping gown. And we switched out the squid head for a spider head and a beautiful cut up the dress just to give it a more sexy look. Um, so we do, we do little, uh, little nods, li nods like that to the D&D system to, uh, to sort of reinforce that, hey, you know what? You're still in a feel of an Infinity Engine style game, even, even if it's not exactly like Dungeons and Dragons. The same thing goes for the spells and abilities that we have in the game. Um, we wanted to make sure that even if we didn't have a standard, the standard arsenal of magic missile and fireball, there were still some equivalents that made you feel like you were able to use those in an environment and you felt really empowered as a magic user. Um, also, we recognize that there are certain things that we cannot do uh, with, a, with, a, with a much smaller team on these role-playing games. And that's fine. And one particular example is 
because the entire game is not going to be voice acted, for which I am incredibly thankful, um, we recognize that a lot of the dialogue that we've been writing for these games, we need to approach it as, as, a, as a reader would, as, as, as if the player is going to be reading these games, not listening to these games. And that's created a different sort of mindset in terms of how we approach dialogue. Because we can actually do things like have uh, specific animators assigned to mapping facial expressions or mapping sort of like, do, or even doing like motion capture rendering for how characters talk, we actually use descriptions a lot to reinforce what a character you're talking to is doing. Like when you actually approach an NPC in Project Eternity, they might, there might be a written description of like, hey, you know, so-and-so scratches their head and then nods sagely at your words. Those are things that would require a lot of animation resources to do in a conversation style game. But because we actually don't have the animation resources, we end up just relying on descriptions uh, for the player to actually interact with, with these characters. And I think to an extent that actually helps immersion because you're allowing your imagination to sort of round out what you think the character sounds like, how they're reacting to you. And I think uh, that sort of heralds back to a lot of the dialogue that occurred in Planescape Torment, for example. We also uh, recognize that there's certain limitations for how we interact with various environments. Uh, we have these things called scripted interactions in Project Eternity, where when you're faced with a certain particular obstacle or a particular challenge, for example, supposing like you need to scale a waterfall or, or leap across a broken bridge, we actually include a, a piece of concept art for these scripted interactions. We describe the scenario for the player and then we provide them a list of options for how they want to approach that obstacle. And uh, that's sort of our way of sort of like doing a nod back to the old school RPGs and go, you know what? We don't actually have the animation resources to do a fully rendered scene of this or a cutscene, but we want to present this in a way where you can sort of digest it and approach it from a more old school format. Um, a lot of our dialogue uh, still uses a lot of the stuff that we use for like the branching you would expect from like Fallout New Vegas or some of our other role playing games like Neverwinter Nights 2. We recognize that with the power of our dialogue editor, even if, we're not, even if we're not voice acting every single node, we still have the same level of branching and reactivity, but even more so than some of our previous titles because we don't have all those resources associated with it. When I was writing back for Fallout 2 way back when, we actually had a lot more freedom with reactivity and bark strings for characters and people reacting to you in the streets of Fallout because we didn't have all those logistic costs associated with the amount of text being generated for the game. So being able to do that once again for Wasteland, for Eternity and Torment has been a huge plus for us. And speaking of Torment, uh, Torment's been uh, an interesting experience from uh, the fact that obviously, for anyone familiar with it, the original Planescape Torment was a very story focused title. And for Tides of Numenera, it's actually one of the pillars that we have for the spiritual successor as well, which is appropriate. The amount of time that we've had to be able to iterate on the story and make sure that it feels right has been really great for us. The, uh, again, uh, sometimes uh, our approach to storylines in a more traditional publisher model has involved a lot of pressure in terms of, in the first month, you must nail down everything. Like you must make sure that the outline's all, all set, it's good to go. So even if the game gets developed over time, there's very little iteration allowed after that point. With Torment and Eternity and Wasteland 2, I feel like we've actually had the time to let the story properly gestate and we've followed the proper paths for making sure that's a, that's a core story experience for the player. There have been a few challenges and a few hurdles in that process. Uh, that level of freedom has sometimes created storyline drafts that have just simply had too much detail in them. And what I mean by that is initially when we try and follow the story process for these games, we try and make sure that we just do like a really uh, brief outline at first that hits all the right story beats. But sometimes uh, narrative designers can get a little carried away. They add way too much detail to that story brief to the point where it's hard to iterate on, where it's hard to revise because there's so much extraneous detail and with, the actual, with the actual outline itself. What we try to focus on is make sure that whenever we do a story draft for one of these games, we focus on First off, the single player experience. What would the player's journey be like if it was just him going through the game, 
no companions, what would all the right story beats be, and what would that story spine be like for the player? Making sure that's strong and then adding the companion interaction later on is how we prefer to approach these things. Because like, when you do the actual story outline and you identify, hey, you know, I'm gonna need a major NPC at this point to provide the following information, or I'm gonna need this person to come in, provide this level of foreshadowing. Those are perfect spots to put companion placement in later on and go, you know what? Why don't we make the NPC information giver there one of the companions in the game and then solve two, solve two problems with just, one, with just one solution. Also, Torment's been really great because it's been one example where we've been able to share the conversation editor with NXile Entertainment. And that was a relatively easy sell because a lot of the developers working on Torment were ones that used the conversation editor back at Obsidian Entertainment. So they understand how to use that editor and the strengths involved with actually, actually being able to write the dialogue uh, in the, with that system. Uh, there's been a few other differences with the Kickstarter process. Uh, one is in terms of how we finance these projects. And I'm not just talking about Kickstarter. Obviously, Kickstarter has been a, a huge sea change in terms of, hey, rather than trying to sell the publishers on a particular idea, why don't we just ask players what they would rather see and see if that's a good enough idea for them to donate funds to it. Uh, about two years ago, uh, I, would, I, I would have said that trying to pitch an isometric old school role playing game to a publisher was a pretty hard sell. Like, it has a bunch of adjectives associated with it that no publisher wants to hear, like old school, Windows focused, uh, isometric, those aren't very sexy words to a publisher and they don't hear a lot of return and profit from a game like that. But now that these games have gone up on Kickstarter, um, rather than not getting a phone call back about pitches like this, we've actually seen a sea change when they approach with publishers with games like this. They realize that this is actually a viable product and it actually can work well with some of their portfolios. Kickstarter has provided a way where games like this are sort of a means where uh, publishers can see how the public reacts to certain titles like this, franchises like this, certain game types like this. And the amount of money they generate ends up being, may not be as much as you would get for a triple A RPG or a triple A console title, but still that works out well for the portfolios for some publishers. And also Kickstarter removes a lot of the risk that publishers might see in a game like that. They're like, oh, people do respond well to an isometric role-playing game. I wonder if that's something we should look into. Sure, we may not make a ton of money off of a product like that, but you know what? Uh, we will generate some profit from it, and that works out really well with our portfolio. So seeing Kickstarter being able to prove out some games like that makes me really hopeful for the future that we'll see even more games being sponsored by publishers. One other thing that's been great about Kickstarter is has a lot to do with one of the shittiest parts of my job, which is I get a lot of design applications every day from people that want to get into game development. And we just do not have room for everybody. So we have to send out a lot of rejection letters to, you know what, we simply just don't have a position right now, check back with us in a few months. What Kickstarter has done, however, and NXile has sort of pioneered this process, is they've found ways to get the larger gaming community involved with the development of the project in a way that helps out the project and helps out the applicant. And one particular aspect they've done is Wasteland 2 had this uh, prop asset request that they sent out to the community where they're like, you know what? We recognize that we have a lot of wasteland to fill up with items and objects, and our art team cannot possibly do all of this. So what they would do is they'd set up uh, these concept art tests for, hey, we have these particular props that we would like to see built. Uh, here's sort of the color schemes, the general direction that we'd like these props to take. Uh, why don't you, uh, if you are interested in contributing to Wasteland 2, uh, why don't you take one of these particular prop sets, see what you can do about building assets for them in Unity, and if we like these props, we will pay you for your time, 
you can put them up on the Unity Asset Store. They'll get an official Wasteland 2 tag associated with them. You'll get game credit for having developed 3D props for an actual title. And also, it helps out the developer in the sense of, thank God we now have 20 variations of rocks, desks, bicycles, wreckage, to actually prop out the environment. So it actually ends up being a mutually beneficial relationship that allows budding game developers to get experience to contribute to a project, even if they're not on it full time. And it also helps the developer in terms of, thank God, now we actually have all these assets we can use to actually prop, like, populate the environments. That's worked out pretty well. And all of this makes me incredibly happy because that means that actually instead of turning people away, we can actually help people with their careers uh, rather than just give them a flat out no. Um, so that is some of the high level uh, Kickstarter changes that uh, have gone into the creation of all these isometric RPGs. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you guys very much for having me here. Uh, I certainly appreciate being able to talk about them. And if you guys had any questions that you wish to ask, uh, I would welcome those now. That would be fantastic. And this would not be your only opportunity to ask questions. You are always welcome uh, to email me uh, if you guys ever need any Kickstarter advice, if you guys ever want me to check out one of your Kickstarters, if you just have general advice for how to get in the game industry. I will always do whatever I can to get back to you and provide you with whatever information you need. It might take a week or two after like a conference like this is done, since my inbox tends to blow up somewhat, uh, but I'd be more than happy to help you guys out. So uh, with that being said, uh, I would be happy to entertain any questions. And I think, sir, you have a question. Uh, so the question is, with the reduced team size and eternity, uh, what do those developer breakdowns tend to be? Uh, the answer for that is we actually, uh, our biggest investment tends to be on the environment art side. Uh, we have a lot of areas uh, to create for eternity. So being able to create those dungeon spaces uh, requires a lot of environment artists. Um, the big challenge we've had is how do you end up developing those environments so that each one feels individualistic? and also allows for, because what we don't want to do is when we actually have a 2D title like this, the last thing we want to do is create a whole series of tiled environments, which is normally what you have to resort, resort to when you're doing a much more 3D style game or even a game like Fallout New Vegas. We actually have an opportunity to sort of customize and paint each of those locations. So that's, that requires a pretty large investment of environment art and also concept artists to do the 2D touch up once the actual block outs are done for each of the levels. So our biggest inv investment has been in terms of environment art. And I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, uh, the question is about scope control. Um, the question is how do we manage our resources so that we, uh, we don't go over budget or uh, do what's, what's, what's called a, you know, a series of feature creep and just end up adding, adding, adding more features to a game? Well, there's a few, there's a few aspects that we, that we deal with. First off is we recognize that with Project Eternity, there are a certain number of things that we promise the backers. Like we need to have two cities. Like we need to have the following levels in the Endless Path dungeon that we set up. We make sure that no matter what, we target those elements first and those become all our A priority items. Everything uh, after that, we recognize that if we need to move those things off or not develop them, the A priority elements are the ones that we need to develop because we promise those to the backers. That, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the other aspect is uh, we also recognize that, um, uh, sorry, hold on a second. It's the appropriate stuff. Uh, we also recognize that we also have a little bit more freedom in iteration uh, for a lot of our aspects as well. Sometimes uh, when developing a contract with a publisher, there are certain things that you 
that you set up as part of the contract that are very hard to amend later on. So we recognize that if certain aspects or abilities or systems aren't working out, that's something that we can discuss with the public in the sense of the following things need to change and why. Lastly also, um, if we recognize that a certain amount of time needs to be invested uh, beyond the due date of a product that we think will make the project better, that is something we've rarely had the luxury for in previous titles. And I would much rather target a certain level of quality and have a delay as a result rather than deliver something we're less than happy with. So that's one aspect of it too. You have a question? You have a question in the back right here. Oh. Uh, hi Chris, uh, I had a question about the Japanese RPG uh, because um, so you were talking about like um, uh, really um, games from the from uh, from uh, from the US and the but uh, I just wanted to have your opinion about those uh, JRPGs um, if uh, if you have been ever influenced by them. Um, yes, so. One rarely known fact about Planescape Torment is that I was playing a lot of Final Fantasy VII at the time, and I thought the whole uh, love triangle in Final Fantasy VII had a lot of influence over uh, the interactions in Planescape Torment between the Nameless One and Fall from Grace and Anna, and that was, you know, I, I, I so, I, so that, that's one dynamic that directly influenced it. Also, the spell system that was present in Final Fantasy VII had a lot of influence over a lot of the spell design that occurred in Torment. So when you see a lot of those big impressive cutscenes for the spells that you fire off in Planescape, a lot of that was also directly influenced by the scope and the majesty that occurred in Final Fantasy VII. One other influence uh, from uh, Japanese RPGs is I also feel that Japanese RPGs are a lot braver and their storylines. Uh, the ones that I can point to specifically are Final Fantasy III, I thought was very narratively brave and how it approached the storyline for that game. Also, uh, Chrono Trigger was very brave in how it approached this narrative. Um, seeing elements like that being developed uh, for a game makes me wish that we would make our stories stronger to compete. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that nowadays. Like. Uh, there's, certain, there's a lot of narratively, narratively, narratively brave elements about Bioshock Infinite that really surprised me and gratified me. Uh, the Walking Dead game had a lot of really brave moments in it that I was like, wow, as a developer, you know, I might have hesitated before doing something like that. But seeing the Western world like, sort of step forward and sort of put their foot down for, here's what makes a story strong has been really encouraging to see. Uh, the question is, uh, do we see the transition from the quality of current Kickstarter games growing over time to the point where people might be departing from working with publishers or larger developers and moving solely over to Kickstarter? Um, I don't believe that people will uh, leave the publisher model entirely, nor will they leave larger developer studios. Like, there will always be a case for, you know, what's the great new summer blockbuster? And some of those things can only be, to be developed with a current, with a current publisher model as it exists. Um, there will always be a case for Call of Duty. There will always be a case for, you know, I look forward to seeing Uncharted come out. I'm like, okay, what's well, going to be great? You know, I'm, I'll camp out in my entire, you know, my condo for an entire week playing that. But what's been encouraging is I was never exactly sure how much funding Kickstarter could raise to develop a game. But then seeing the crowdsourcing model that Star Citizen has had, and I guess they're what, over, over 20 million now? I'm like, I, I would never have been able to imagine that. And I think as people become more comfortable with using Kickstarter to back various projects, like, you know, I think people like, I think seeing elements like in the Veronica Mars movie come out in Kickstarter drew more attention to it. Uh, and I think the more opportunities people come to Kickstarter to contribute, you'll start seeing the funding goals for projects rise up over time until uh, I think that it becomes a viable way to create more mainstream products with the same budgets. I think uh, over time that's what's going to happen. And I, I was doubtful before, about two years ago, if you'd asked me that question, I'd be like, well, I don't really know. It's mostly for more, low, you know, small, smaller scale, you know, games. But uh, based on the recent trends I've been seeing go up, 
and up and up. So. Oh, also, I'm sorry, actually, I'm going to go back to one of my previous questions. Someone asked about the, uh, the resource and scope management for our titles. The one aspect that I was tripping over and forgot to mention is if any of you are ever planning to do a Kickstarter, there are some people out there that advocate uh, setting a funding goal that is a little bit less than you think it might take to make the game because you're afraid of scaring backers off. Please never use that strategy. Always be upfront with here is the actual cost that it is going to take to make the game. Like, always be responsible with your backers. And that is absolutely what we do with Project Eternity. We recognize that this funding goal is pretty large, but based on everything that we know in terms of our burn rate for our employees, and by burn rate, I mean like how much it costs per month to have them in the studio, how much it's going to cost for uh, developing the levels, which, I mean, we had all these pipelines still left over from doing these similar games back at Black Isle. So we understood the whole process for how long it takes to lay out a level, like how long it takes to do the design documentation for it, how long it takes to write certain characters. All of that became part of our budgeting mechanism for, okay, this funding goal is a little bit higher than we would like to pitch to the public, but it's a responsible figure, so we're just going to do it. And uh, I will say there have been a number of Kickstarters I know of out there that have been canceled because they bear, they're just about to make their funding goal, but they realize that's not going to be enough. And that's just more of a, just not being upfront with your backers about what it actually takes to make a game. So be fiscally responsible with your Kickstarters and be aware of what it, what it costs to make the game and also what it costs in terms of physical goods and rewards that you're promising your backers as well, because that can eat up a lot of your costs. Um, so the way it's structured is across all these projects is uh, I'm, uh, so the question is like how do I divide my time amongst the projects. Uh, so first off, uh, Project Eternity is my primary focus. Uh, when I'm at uh, Obsidian for 40 or 50 hours, uh, that is my, my focus project. Like that's what I work on narratively. I provide whatever production support, uh, do whatever writing is necessary, uh, help out with marketing efforts, all, that, all of those elements. Um, and when I'm totally exhausted a Project Eternity and I just simply cannot crank out any more creative juice out of that, that's when I go home and I go, okay, now I can shift gears and go to another universe where I don't have quite as much writer's block. And then uh, I can do uh, design doc reviews uh, for the new Torment game. Uh, I can play around with character concepts for that. I can write a few brief encounters for FTL that build up over time. Being able to shift gears like that actually lets me offset a problem. I, be, I, I might be struggling with, it, with eternity, let that cook for a while, and then jump back to it the next day a little bit more refreshed. So that, that's, been a, that's been a big help in that respect. And, then, and when I volunteered for FTL, that was kind of the goal behind that too. Because the nice thing about FTL is, so I love playing that game, you know, and I love designing encounters for it. But the nice thing about doing writing for FTL is you can focus on a really small encounter, make it interesting, and do that in about 15 minutes, which I'm not used to with a role-playing game. Like even doing like a simple merchant or like a minor NPC, that requires a lot of narrative and narrative thought and hours to actually implement a character like that. So being able to switch off like that has been, has been pretty handy and also leaves my weekends pretty full. So. So the question is, with all the branching and reactivity that we have in our titles, how do we still maintain the overall story arc and creative vision? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, what we try and do is make sure that uh, we always have a creative lead associated with every project. And their sole goal is to make sure that not only that do they review all the dialogues in the game to make sure they're consistent, they're following all the proper terminology, they don't contradict each other, 
they're also making sure that the overall narrative vision is being followed as well. So they're sort of like a mini project director, except they're solely responsible for the story. And then we have like we obviously have people that are in charge of like the level environments. We have people that are in charge of the systems. But we actually have one specific person devoted to the story, regardless of how many narrative designers there are in the studio. That person oversees them all, makes sure they're all communicating, and that high level vision is still being maintained. There's a lot of other elements um, and uh, designs that we use to keep track of that stuff. Um, we don't. We we try and make sure that we also choose our battles very carefully in terms of what's actually going to cause high-level reactivity versus more minor changes in the environment. And what may seem like a very complicated mechanism, when we actually break it down in terms of tasking and elements on SharePoint and making sure certain flags and information is being tracked, it's actually not too bad to manage as long as you have someone focused and dedicated to it, which we try and make sure that we do. And plus, we've, we've done this about you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 times. So we, we've sort of suffered through all the mistakes with the process before. So uh, we're pretty comfortable with it right, right now. We good? So we have five more minutes. So uh, I almost feel like I've been devoting my time to the second room. You, sir. Uh, the question is, is pen and paper gaming a good way to train yourself uh, for level design? I would say it's not a bad way. It is not the best way. Uh, my advice would be anyone looking to get into level design or world building for a role playing game in particular, actually I guess just for any game, go out there and find the editor that they use to make a game that you like. Like if you, if you liked uh, Fallout New Vegas, go download the GEC and start building your own levels. That is the best way to get training and feedback on whether your level designs are good, get familiar with the process, and if at all possible, try and make sure you put your levels out on the web and mods for players to play so you can get feedback from players as well because that's also an important part of the process. So uh, just to give a specific example of a situation that worked with that is, um, we had a world builder for New Vegas called uh, Jorge Salgado, who's a very cool guy. He uh, did one of the best things you can do if you're looking to get into game design, and that's he did the job before he got the job. He loved ob Oblivion, but he's like, you know what? I wonder if I can do more with it. So he took the Oblivion editor, and he decided he was going to rewrite the world. You know, he had very modest ambitions. He was just going to rewrite, rewrite the world. So he spent a long time doing this mod called Oscuro's uh, Oblivion Overhaul mod. He uh, released that to the public. It got 300,000 downloads. It got like a player review score of 9.9. 9.9 from players, like that was crazy. Then he did three iterations of that mod. He put out patch notes, got more feedback, and then he applied to us. He's like, hey, do you guys need a world builder? We already, know who he, we already knew who he was. We are like, oh my god, Oscuro just applied to us. Because we'd seen his work out there, he'd already gone through the process of being a game designer. He knew all the elements. He knew the editor. He knew the engine. He was able to teach us things. So when he applied, the interview was mostly a formality to see if he was an asshole or not. And we're like, wow, this guy's great. We hired him on board. He started working on New Vegas. That's probably one of the best ways to approach getting into level design that you can do. So that's probably the, the, the strongest thing I would recommend. Um, what has your experience been like working on the South Park RPG? And how is that going right now? South Park RPG is the question. Uh, so I cannot talk a lot about the South Park RPG. That's in the domain of Ubisoft. And I think if I said anything, my phone would start ringing and or a gunshot would ring out and suddenly the, my head would explode. Uh, but there are some elements about the South Park RPG I can talk about. First off, um, approaching that narratively has been interesting because this is one case where the franchise holders absolutely, in every way, shape, or form, know the characters, the situations, the setups, the social themes they might want to play around with, and even the RPG themes they want to make fun of far better than we ever will. So getting scripts from Matt and Trey uh, are really, 
when we, when we read those, they, they nail their characters perfectly. Getting all the voice acting for it has been really, really cool. One of the best parts about the process is when they start kicking around ideas for quest lines and they start getting really excited about it, suddenly they'll start breaking into the voices of the characters, interacting with that quest line. Then we just sort of sit back and hit the record button and actually listen to go through it. So seeing, seeing their level of excitement and engagement with the product to that extent has been really, really cool. And they are big game players themselves. So seeing them and then meeting with them and then hearing their critiques about you know uh, games that have just come out you know and like you know their feelings on Deus Ex for whatever and then listen to the critiques about that has been really entertaining to hear and it also informs us as to why when they request certain design elements or when they want certain systems developed why they're asking for elements like that and then we just see about implementing uh, the franchise as they how they see fit and uh, based on all the laughter that we hear from the focus testers that come in and play the game it seems like it's going pretty well so uh, I know I think you'd be happy with it. Uh, the question is, with more uh, bigger name uh, developers joining Kickstarter, becoming part of Kickstarter, is there a danger that lesser known developers will be, will be driven out or won't get as much attention through Kickstarter? I would argue that that has always been the case and always been a problem. Um, there's ways to fight that. Um, and some of the advice that I offer is that if you are uh, a, not a well-known developer, um, there are certain things that you can do with your Kickstarter to sort of give it more prominence. One is try and find um, a more well-known individual uh, who likes the type of game you're developing or you think might respond well to your type of game. Write them a personal email saying, hey, would you, guy, would you mind checking out this project that I feel pretty passionate about? I think it's right up your alley. And if you happen to like it, you know, I certainly wouldn't mind to mention. Like, don't send out form letters to everybody that, you know, is in the gaming industry and ask them to support your Kickstarter because anything, you know, causes me to hit the delete button faster. It's getting spam mail like that. But if you actually genuinely think a certain more well-known personality would respond well to a certain project, don't hesitate to ask them and have them call attention to your project. Like, when uh, Ragnar Tarnquist was doing the Dreamfall chapter uh, Kickstarter, he knew that Felicia Day had liked the original Dreamfall project. So he just dropped her a line, like, hey, you know, Felicia, you've called out Dreamfall before. Uh, you obviously like it. We're doing the Kickstarter. Would you happen to be willing to give it a mention? And, you know, she was willing to do that. And so if you target, uh, like, individuals like that, they can promote the product, that's certainly good. Um, uh, and that's one piece of advice that I would offer if you're a lesser known developer. There's a way to sort of hook in that, that larger developer world or more well-known personalities just by asking. Oh, I think that's it. Thank you guys very much for having me. Appreciate it.